we would like to thank you again for giving us the opportunity to talk with you, hear your experiences and voice. Uh, I'll just start with a brief introduction. Um, Mrs. Hosna Jalil uh, was born in 1992. Um, she studied physics and majored in business and management at the American University of Afghanistan. She served as the Deputy Minister of Policy and Strategy at the Ministry of Interior Affairs and also as Head of Policy and Research Directorate at the Ministry of Mines and Petroleum of Afghanistan. She was appointed as the Deputy Minister of Policy and Plan at the Ministry of Women Affairs. She was the first woman to be elevated to such a high ranking position in the ministry. Uh, while Deputy Minister, uh, she successfully implemented policies that aimed to transform the police's mandate from the battlefield to guardianship bolster women's recruitment and make the institution more efficient. This was in addition to child protection and gender policies, as well as many others. Over the course of her career, she served as an analyst, chief executive officer, brand ambassador, and member of boards for different local and international organizations. We have a lot to learn from her, and we're very happy that she's here with us today. So Mrs. Jenny. I'll start with my first question. You have spent part of your childhood under the Taliban rule. You have underlined multiple times that there's a misconception or a misjudgment that the Taliban will change or has changed. Could you reflect on the current situation? Uh, what do you think lies ahead? We, earlier when we, we have been discussing on different platforms about why do I believe the Taliban is the same Taliban? There are a couple of reasons behind that. The first one is Taliban might try to well behave, although they mess it up again. They might try to well behave in some of the major cities and particularly in the areas, even in major cities in the area, including Kabul, in areas where people have access to media and they're well connected to other parts of the world. And they're trying to well behave because at this point in time, two reasons again. Um, from the international community, they need, they need the financial assistance, but at the same time, they need the international recognition as a state. Um, and the other reason is because they cannot uh, manage the whole chaos across the whole country all at once. So they just want things to die down and then step by step, they are going to target different pillars. Uh, even when it comes to the target killings they have for the loud voices, I mean, they're, they're um, targeting and killing or assassinating the loud voices, the ones that they believe they can create a trouble for them later, because they, they're too loud and they, they reflect what they can, they, they see what they go through. Um, even in, when it comes to the assassinations or the target killings, I'm telling you, this is not the Taliban that we are talking about. They are more brutal than what we can see right now on the ground. Um, so that's why I would say they have categorized their behavior or they, are, um, they, have, they have adopted or customized their behavior and their practices in different parts of the country. If we right now, if we go to another part of the country where people does not have women particularly, does not have access to media because women is the major, I would say, victim for their um, um, practices and policies and principles, or I would say those extremist uh, ideas. So if we go to parts of the country where we don't have access to media, uh, it's exactly the same Taliban ruling regime where, that, that we have been uh, living under before 2001. So you can see the same, uh, I mean, situation, lack of access to, to um, education, lack of access to health services, limited, I would say, access to health services, lack of access to justice, um, food securities is something that the women are struggling, shelter is not there for them, of course. It's not for, for the whole population because we've got a lot of uh, IDPs right now in Afghanistan because of the conflict and the Taliban controlled areas. But at the same time, employment, that's gone. So whatever we have been claiming that we have achieved uh, during the de democratic republic's um, governance, that is almost gone. And those parts of the country that we are talking about, which are not, um, have access to media, they don't have much to leverage on Taliban. 
And at the same time, even when it comes to their parents, they've gone back to work. At least my hometown, um, they've gone back to work. Plus many other provinces that I'm checking on. So that is, I would say, um, part of the reason that I'm, I'm telling you, I mean, I, I keep uh, saying and I keep repeating myself that Taliban has not changed, but they are more brutal in terms of their assassinations and in terms of the grudges that they have, uh, which I mean, that they have right now, which is being developed over 20 years. So that makes them even more brutal. As you specialize in the woman peace and security framework, we wanted to hear your views on what could have been done differently with regards to U.S.'s sudden withdrawal. Do you think that the lack of women's existence in the peace process played a part in this current outcome? Not at all, because um, when it comes to the women's prisons, yes, on the Taliban side, we did not have any women. That's against their principle. That's against their um, core ideology to have women around the table. For them, women is, I mean, I'm, I'm quite clear, for them, women is there to serve men, to give birth to their ch children, and that's it. Um, but then on the government side, we had the loudest, the, um, I would say, the most prominent women figures in, in the, um, around the table, who has not just been advocating for women's rights, around the peace, I mean, around the table, I think it's a matter of quality. Yes, I would have loved to have more in terms of the numbers, but the quality of the members that we had and their voices, the quality was much better than many men that we had around that table. And they've been the loudest. And lately I heard from one of our international allies who has been engaged very much um, in the peace process in Doha, and he was telling me that the Taliban are trying to influence the women. And they, they, they are not care, I mean, they don't care much about the men. And it, it is, of course, because they can find women as hard negotiators. That's why they're trying hard to, to influence them. Um, for me, because it's always a matter of the quality and they haven't just been advocating for women's rights, they have been advocating for minorities' rights, for the children's rights for the human rights, for the development of the country, the infrastructure we have developed over these years, the economic situation, the political stability, and they've been, they've had a very diversified basket to negotiate on. So I would say the quality really matters and we did have the quality in terms of the women's uh, participation and presence in the, around the table. Quantity wise, it wasn't, the number wise, it wasn't equal. But I'm happy, that, uh, I'm happy that the quality was compensating it. If we relate that to the um, collapse of the country, no. When it comes to the women's right, why don't we have it first? If we have been expecting, I mean, why um, the situation is so for women in Afghanistan right now and how we are relating that to the whole peace process or the peace deal. First, if we have been dreaming or if we have been projecting a Taliban takeover like it happened, uh, a month ago, then for sure, we cannot change Taliban and their ideology. The ideology, they believe the principle that they have uh, tried to convince their friendly states, including Pakistan, their fighters on the ground, their financial supporters, that is what puts them together. That's the center of gravity for them. All of a sudden, we are uh, expecting Taliban um, whose, I would say, somehow strength has been due to ideologies and beliefs and principles. All of a sudden, we expect them to change it when they take over, of course not. So if we have been expecting a takeover from Taliban, it is very, I mean, it's not practical at all to expect them to have, um, I would say, to give more space to women, to respect their basic rights. That's beyond, I would say, expectation. But what could have done differently, it's not about the peace negotiation between the Afghan government and the Taliban. The Afghan government peace negotiators, they had hard time to talk to Taliban even. Taliban have not been ready to talk to them. Taliban have even not been considering talking to them around the table and they have never been serious about it. So the serious platform when it comes to the whole peace deal was the peace deal between the US and the Taliban. And that is when we could change um, the, the uh, today's, I would say, situation, we could change the destiny. 
Um, and I would say, although I can understand that although it was between the Taliban and the U.S. government with just two terms, and part of that was uh, to make sure that Afghanistan is not used as a safe haven for the terrorists and it's not going to threat the U.S. Uh, national interest, of course. And uh, at the same time, Taliban is not going to attack them again. So yes, part of that was that, but we could also add that Taliban need to make sure because it is, even if that's something not between the Afghan government and the Taliban, even let's forget that the Afghan government has been a strategic partner to the US government, even let's forget that. But what is the mechanism to make sure that Afghanistan is not used as a, ter a terrorist safe haven? The mechanism, of course, one of the major factors to making sure or one of the measures to making sure is to have a more inclusive government because then Af Afghanistan can again Afghanistan has two very different worlds I mean inside Afghanistan when you enter when you enter you will find two very different worlds not the north and the south the conservatives and the modern ones so to make make sure that we don't have again the, the civil war which again paves the way for terrorist activities we don't have the civil war, we don't have the conflict, we don't have the insurgencies, but at the same time, we need to, we, we needed to make sure we have got a more independent uh, state, which is not heavily relying on Pakistan. But right now we don't have it. So we needed to make sure that we do have a state which can manage, which can handle, even if not financially, but politically and militarily, they can handle themselves. We needed to make sure something like that. The US was rushing to, to get this deal done, and those terms might have added to the time frame, uh, so that that's what we missed in that term. Is the reason that I mentioned that we needed to make sure why Pakistan? We needed to make sure that the uh, government, the, the government or the ruling regime, it's not a government yet. The ruling regime is not relying heavily militarily, intelligence-wise, and uh, politically on on Pakistan. Is because let's not forget that. Um, what the USA right now is claiming why they entered Afghanistan was for sure to, um, I would say to target bin Laden. That was one of the, the main reasons that they clearly announced it. But let's not forget them. First, the attack was not, I mean, no one was involved in that attack of 9-11. There was no Afghan in those, uh, as, as hijackers. None of the hijackers has been Afghans first. Second, Osama bin Laden 10 years ago when he was um, uh, targeted, he was not in Afghanistan. He was in a Pakistan camp. So the reason that I'm, I'm saying this is because even if, if Afghanistan back then was either invaded or was uh, attacked and the, the coalition entered Afghanistan, yes, Afghanistan, because it was not an internationally, uh, I would say, recognized state, and it could be an unlawful country, and it could be could have been difficult for the international community to track what's going on in that country. Yes, we did not have those systems that many of our neighbor countries has that, and it makes a lot of sense if even if we try to justify why they entered Afghanistan. Then, but at the end of the day, we should not uh, forget how Taliban is again um, connected to other insurgent groups and other terrorist groups in the region and internationally, and at the same time what kind of support they're receiving from other states. So it's not basically, it's not an independent one so that we can deal with them and that's it. The deal is there. Well, my question would be, who are these countries who are backing up Taliban? You mentioned Pakistan, but other countries or institutions or, or groups are backing Taliban then? Um. To my information and understanding, I would say, of course, Pakistan publicly announces that. And their prime minister is uh, going to the press and they're announcing it. Um, but then we do have countries who keeps denying, I mean, they're in a denial mood of their um, connection with the Taliban or support to the Taliban because they're not, uh, they're not I mean, uh, backing Taliban's ideology but they have got their own counterinsurgency or counter threat approach. So they do have their own, I would say, counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, or, or countering the threats they have approach. And part of that is to, again, to back Taliban as, to some extent, but they keep denying the fact that they're supporting them. They're not as loud or as public as Pakistan, but they do. 
In the last 20 years, we have had Russia proofs. Russia um, uh, had left behind or the footprints they had left behind that they are engaged with Taliban and supporting them. Iran was another country that they have been engaged with. Uh, happily, we did not have any country that China, uh, we did not have any information or footprints of China, but now China is much more interested with the Taliban's government to, uh, to recognize them because they have got their own economic interests. But back then we did not have any information that China has left any footprint of, of um, uh, engaging with Taliban at such a some extent. But then we, of course, Saudi Arabia was one of the countries that always had the, um, the stamp on, on their, their face of uh, backing Taliban's ideology. But there are so many, it's not just a matter of footprints, there are so many events. If you just put them together, you, you can figure out like, um, they do have, to some extent, they are denying all these countries. They are denying the fact that they have, they have had any sort of like connections with the Taliban, but they have left footprints behind in Afghanistan. And our intelligence kept shouting, like these are the countries that they need to step back because they're terrorist organizations, and it's not according to the international laws. It's it's against the international. I would say violating international laws if if a state is supporting terrorist group or organization. But no one heard them. So those are the countries they keep denying and they keep uh, arguing that there is no footprints. But even back then, Afghanistan, the intelligence or the government, they announced like these are the countries that they need to step back. So could the U.S. Um, help to build uh, the, uh, that independence that you are talking about of uh, the, the of the Afghanistan state? I mean, where was? Was that on their agenda when, uh, while they were there for 20 years? Um, I would say lately, I mean, it depends. When they entered 2001, it was a different, uh, I would say, uh, there was a whole different strategy and plan in place. When they left, things have been changed uh, immensely. And even the statements, the political statements have been conflicting. Even I would say the, um, it's, it's not just about the US, but even about most of the European countries and other allies of Afghanistan or the partners or parts who, who have been part of the coalition. Um, the statements, I'm, I'm just giving a very simple example on the women's rights. They kept convincing their nation, their taxpayers, all these countries, not just the US. They kept convincing their taxpayers, their nation, like, okay, part of the reason inside that basket, a prominent factor is because we need to make sure that human rights and women's rights is not violated in Afghanistan. And most of them somehow justified their presence in Afghanistan that way, with that basket. Of course, there has been so many other different aspects of it, but women's right and human's right has been one of the very major factor in that basket or a major, um, I would say, outcome they have been expecting. But then all of a sudden, they all... Um, um, change the statement like we have never been there for the women's rights or the human rights. So I hope, I mean, happily, the digital world records everything and anyone can just go back to all these statements. But end of the day, I would say the situation has been very different. When they entered Afghanistan, uh, in the middle of, of their, I would say, partnership, but at the end. But at the same time, I can't say that they haven't been um, helping the Afghan government or they haven't had in mind to have a more inclusive government. When we are talking about the stability, I'm, I'm talking of, of, of a more inclusive government then. Um, a government which does not change the constitution we have right now, the Republic constitution, to an Emirates constitution. So um, what I would say is when we have diverse, a diversified group which is leading a country, a diversified, I would say, um, uh, planning uh, team or a diversified strategist or a diversified policy makers, then that is when we have, we can have like all the voices heard, but, heard, but at the same time we can have more stability. But e because even if one part would like to lean on an, a, another country or would like to lean on an, a specific ideology, there will be two or three other parties which would take care of the, the uh, which would balance them at some point in time. I can't say that the USA was not having that in mind. They did have, they proposed um, to, again, to my information and understanding, there might be more information on that that 
I don't have access to that. Um, to my again, to my information, the U.S. government has been pushing for a more inclusive government where we could um, give the space to Taliban. Um, but that was again on the that's where where I would say we had shortcomings from the the government side. It was so difficult for everyone to uh, to give space to a group that we have been fighting for 20 years. Yes, it is difficult to manage. It is difficult to convince the nation and to convince your uh, security sector forces. Like, okay, there's a peace deal and they're gonna be our neighbors. They're gonna be living with us and they're gonna um, share means with us and they're gonna share institutions with us. At the end, they're gonna share power with us. And the ones that you have fought with for the last 20 years, like the nation, the, the uh, security sector forces, they might give you a security decision one day and you have to implement it. That is, of course, it, it requires a lot and it, it takes a lot for a government to manage a process like that. But end of the day, the government, that is something that I would consider that as a shortcoming from the government side as well. You have contributed to changing perceptions, recruiting more women officers and creating a safer working environment for women. You have taken multiple positions within the political sphere. Uh, what can we learn from these experiences? Is there a way way to maintain some of the advancements that were achieved over the years? Sometimes when I'm talking about the women's achievement post 2000, 2001 or post 9-11 or the, the transitional government or post Taliban regime, I'm not speaking of women's presence in the health sector or in the education sector. I'm mainly talking of women's presence in technology, women's presence in sports, women's presence, even when we are talking about the women's presence in education and health sector, I'm speaking of women's presence in decision-making rules in those sectors. They are not just a, a nurse or they're not supposed to be just a teacher. They can also be a school principal. They can also be health minister. They can also be health deputy minister. Or they can also be the chief of a ward, the, the, the head of a hospital. That is something that we did not have in, in, in the uh, during Taliban regime. They could be a medical doctor, they could be a teacher for in hope, in houses, teachers for uh, girls sometimes, but it was also limited opportunity. But they could never be a school principal, of course. So uh, what I would say sometimes when I'm speaking of women's achievements are the decision-making rules we have given to them, the their presence in the civil services, that that was something like 28% in just 20 years. We had 28% of the civil servants in Afghanistan who has been running 28% of the government basically as women. And at the same time, we have had something like 11% decision makers among them. So I would say that was the achievement that we have been considering, but the, the I would say the achievement which we have been thinking we have had a fast paced progress was their presence in the security sector. So if a women's, presen women's presence in the media is, is one of the, the major, I would say, achievement we consider their, their presence in technology, their presence in media. But the last one and the most challenging one for the Republic was women's presence in security sector and defense sector. But then if we would see that women's presence in media is gone overnight, Exactly the, the, the day the Taliban is taking over Kabul, the next day they're changing the anchor of the TV, of our national TV, a professionally well-trained, I would say, uh, woman with a mullah. Then, I mean, it, it, it gives them the clear message that, of course, there's no space for women in the security sector. And of course, there's no, no space for women in the security sector let alone women's presence and decision-making rules across the country or, or uh, something which is, of course, beyond their, I would say, not just expectation, but beyond their belief. And the next day, of course, they went to the national TV and they announced like, okay, women are not, um, I mean, it's, it's beyond their capacity to, to manage something or to lead something or to lead a government component. Um, or to serve in the security sector, of course, that that's basically beyond their expectation. That's not something they clearly mentioned, but they clearly mentioned that women are there to, to serve men. The women are born, actually, to serve men and to give birth to kids, to their children. Simple as that. 
So that's how they're defining women's role. And security sector is the first, the first one to be gone, and that's already gone, actually. Um, can we say that even though these are being attacked at the moment, uh, what has been built over the years has created this legacy within the people who have experienced these institutions and these advancements? And maybe can we say that there is now the emergence of this vibrant movement within Afghanistan as well and within kind of what has become the diaspora. Uh, and they're very active, they're pursuing various forms of advocacy, activism. So uh, how would you evaluate the role of memory, the role of kind of uh, external mobilization in this process? Because Afghan women are speaking out everywhere within Afghanistan, around the world. So how would you just maybe reflect on the, the movement that is still growing and that is still very active? Um, let me put it, um, I mean, when it comes to, let, let me just divide uh, the response to this question. The first one, why do we have the resistance we have now and we did not have the same level of resistance, particularly from the women's side, um, in the first round of Taliban's ruling regime? We did not have the same level of resistance. Again, part of that is because in their first round of ruling regime, the women or the whole population, I would say, they enter to their ruling regime or they have been trapped with their ruling regime because the, the people, I mean, they haven't been resisting because they have had many years of civil war with Mujahideen, with all the other groups. And they have been, um, I would say, traumatized enough that they just wanted to have a monopoly of power so that there wouldn't be one attacking the other one, I would say, um, a militia attacking the other one. And in the middle, it was civilians which was victimized, which has been uh, killed. So all they needed to, to, to have was uh, security, that's it. They just didn't want it to have more, I would say, RPGs being um, shot on the, 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 on the civilian homes or houses or on, on, on a bus on the street. That's all they wanted. Their expectation was dropped to zero. Um, and that is why we did not have much resilience or much resistance because they have been getting out of hell and going to another hell. But the resistance we have now is one. I can't say there was equality across the country. No, there was not equality across the country. That is something we've been fighting for for the last 20 years. That's why we have been loud all these years. That's why we have been trying hard in order to change what we can based on our own capacities. No, there was not equality. But what, what was there, I mean, we have been able in different parts of the country, again, there has been different um, levels of services, opportunities and resources. And even among women, I kept claiming that we are not able to provide equal access to opportunities, resources, and um, I would say uh, services, even to women across the country. It's not just a matter of men and women, equality between men and women. It's a matter of equality among women themselves. We did not have it. So what happens is that, um, again, we have been able to enjoy the basic rights. When it comes to education, yes, in some parts of the country, the little girls could go easier to a school. In some other parts of the country, based on a couple of reasons, I mean, different factors, including security situation, the girls' school has been banned, or they've been bombed, or the government could not open a, a new school there. So there has been different challenges, but again, in terms of the health services, in terms of education, access to justice, there was a foundation there and anyone could enjoy the minimum basic rights. But at the same time, it's not a matter of what we had back then. It's a matter of how we are going to build it over time, how we are going to achieve the, the foundation was there, how we are going to project the future for our, our future generation, what we are going to leave behind for our future generations. That is a matter. But now that, um, I would say, uh, foundation is gone, which is, um, 
um, which makes it, 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 it which makes it a little bit difficult to imagine how we can I would say reestablish them or how we can regain them or how we can protect it because when the foundation is gone we it's 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 going to be difficult to to protect the, the achievements we have had. We've got a huge portion of the population right now which is resisting, and that huge portion of the population first it's women, second. 67% of the population in Afghanistan, I call them post 9-11 generation. They're in their, their 20s or less than 20s. So it's, it's a very young population. And for them, some of, most of them, they even have not had the experience. They haven't had their childhood or, or they don't remember their childhood during Taliban regime. They've enjoyed the uh, rights, the freedom that has been given by the Republic to them. And I'm speaking of the urban areas and the rural areas. And anyone had the, the, the choice to choose how to live at the same time. No one was forcing them. If I wanted to be conservative, I could be conservative. If I wanted to be in a, in a city and to have a modern life, I could do that as well. Of course, there has been limitation. There has been a range in terms of the, even that freedom. Nothing was unlimited. But there has been the freedom of choices. There has been the freedom in terms of the decision making. And we had it. Part of the resist, part of the reason that they're resisting is because they have this internal motivation, like, I don't want to go back. I don't want to, I don't want the, the doors to be closed for me, the, the windows to be closed for me. Part of the resistance is because their internal motivation is there. And the other part of the resistance, how do I compare this with the uh, first round of the ruling the Taliban's ruling regime is because back then the women, the, the youngsters are the ones who are resistance, the ones who are against Taliban's ideology, they don't want to live under Taliban's flag, is because they did not have many means that they have today in terms of raising their voices, in terms of um, having a more civilized and peaceful approach to resist, to raise their voices and to let everyone know like I'm not happy. They did not have much of it. And right now, one of the biggest or the major means they have in hand is the media again in Afghanistan. And they're connecting to the world. But back then, I remember, Afghanistan was not many countries in, in, in the country even might not remember there's another country or another piece of land on, on this planet called Afghanistan. It was a forgotten piece of land on, on, on this planet. But right now, I mean, the media that has been media is one of the major achievements of the Afghan government. The media in hand of, of this, these women and these youngsters is connecting them to the world. And even if the states would ignore, there are so many human beings on this planet and they would be the voice of, of, of them as well. And they would push their own governments because they echo the same values. They share the same values. So part of the resistance inside Afghanistan is because they have got a better mean right now in, in, in their hand. And at the same time, they have got this motivation because all of a sudden things are collapsing from an environment where they're at least having the, the freedom of choices and freedom of, of um, decisions and, um, and having the basic rights to, to enjoy, right? But then we have got the diaspora out of the country. These are the ones who have left Afghanistan because their lives have been under threat or they have had, I would say they had, they had to leave many behind in terms of the, the human beings surrounding them, the individuals surrounding them. But at the same time, they had to leave behind the whole country. They have to leave behind their home. They have to leave behind their identity. So the diaspora out of Afghanistan who are, um, I would say, resisting is because they're dreaming of going back. They don't want to give up on their country because that's all they have. In, in, I mean, that's all they have invested themselves into. I mean, anyone that I know around me who have left the country, for us, Afghanistan is our identity. And we can never give up on that. It's not just a piece of land for us that we can live in that. That's something, an identity that we worked for very hard for the last 20 years. We celebrated all those little achievements we had and we grieved everything we lost during this, this 20 years. We worked hard to, uh, to regain them. So the diaspora out of Afghanistan, yes, they are allowed. But it also depends, um, what I would say is being loud is one thing, but have, be having a more strategic approach is another thing. If we want to change something for Afghanistan is 
um, we need to have, I mean, both the, the diaspora and the ones who are on the ground right now in Afghanistan who are resisting, they need to have the same voices, they need to echo the same message, they need to make sure that they're speaking, they have a common ground in terms of presenting what's really going on and what we want in Afghanistan. But then at the same time, um, it's not just a matter of being loud or, or I would say raising the voices. It's a matter of when to raise the voices, where to raise the voices and to whom we need to, uh, who, who should be our audience, who should be the target audience so that we can have, um, we, we can have an outcome. The force in front of them is a, an armed force which used to be a terrorist organization and I still consider them at an individual level. I still consider them a terrorist organization, a terrorist group, which now is trying to establish maybe a terrorist state. They have in front of them that has no, I would say, uh, uh, no management uh, capability to manage um, a civilized protest or a civilized approach, um, resistance. But at the same time, they don't have the experience of how to manage that. All they know is anyone who's raising the voice, just shoot it. Shoot them or her. And they can go extra mile again, they can cross any red line to, to oppress the, the civilian uh, and peaceful, I would say, protest or peaceful resistance. But again, I'm happy um, how peaceful and how civilized our approach is today after 20 years, and that is an achievement that I would consider. Because we haven't been as peaceful as we are today when it comes to resisting. Because it requires a lot of passions. It requires a lot of, I would say, compromises and sacrifices you have to make. If you have a more peaceful approach to, in front of a very brutal uh, armed force or armed fighters or group. So that is the resistance. But we need to make sure at this point in time, I can see that it's also scattered. We need to make sure we have got a very organized um, and at the same time strategic approach to, to make sure that we get an outcome out of um, what we do and out of the efforts we make. What can international actors and feminists do to support women's rights in Afghanistan today? As you have underlined in another interview, what can international actors do to ensure that the door is not shut on them? Again, I, I want to divide in different parts, like what international community do in, in different uh, fields. The first one is, yes, I don't want the Taliban's regime to be recognized internationally. That's going to be their strength and our weakness later. Um, and we're not really supposed to have a, an organization or um, not organization, a terrorist group that is right now controlling a state, a country and controlling a nation. We don't want that to, to sit exactly by, by the side of, of another state or another country, which is, I would say, claiming to promote women's right or human right or children's right or minority right. It's an embarrassment for the whole world. If we are gonna have a state like that, they need to either make sure that um, they force Taliban to have a more inclusive government and they have, I would say more, I mean, they don't change the laws in a sense that they, um, I would say, take away all the core values in terms of the human rights or women's rights or children's rights or minorities, or the equal citizenship approach. They don't take that away from the, the, the laws and they don't, they don't bring back their um, Emirates laws. So that's why that's something that I'm, of course, I don't want the international community to do that. And I don't recommend something like that because it's gonna have a very harsh consequences later maybe. But then at the same time, it means like, I don't want the, the international recognition for that state, but I do want the humanitarian assistance on the ground. And that is something which is very immediately needed. But then the other, um, I would say proposal or recommendation that I would have for, for the feminist organizations mainly, and it's not just the feminist organization, it can be any citizen of any country across the world, one voice matters. And all these drops makes an ocean. Um, let me blunt, be blunt here, or very bold here. We do have um, many different states across the world, and they do use human rights and women's rights or children's rights, or let, let, let's put it in, in the human rights package or the women's rights package. They do use it as a legitimacy means for themselves, but they don't mean it. They're not genuine about it. Because what I found is that, yes, politics is dirty, 
but it has its own values. If we respect those values, we can also play politics with values, but you can hardly find states that are not pushed on the, that are not reminded on the human rights and women's rights. Who cares about it? It's all a war of, of resources and a war of power where the human right and women right does not have much space in that package. It just legitimizes war. It just legitimizes, I would say, um, sometimes, um, uh, I mean, the, the, the competition for power. So what I would say, all the feminist organizations, the organizations which are supporting women's rights and they do believe in, in equal rights of women and men, but at the same time, all the citizens, what I would tell them is that first, one voice matters. Second, they need to push their governments, no matter where they are. Their government can play a role and they can play a role in their own government in changing their government's policies and practice. At this point in time, for the international community, and I'm referring mainly to the states, is that they need to push hard for an inclusive government. We definitely would go back when it comes to, uh, that is something that I even, when was I was expecting it, when we have been doing the peace talks with the um, Taliban, we would have, we would go back. Some of the achievements we have for the women's right would freeze, even if not, we, I mean, the ideal situation is first, it would freeze. Uh, because we have to negotiate with the Taliban on every little details, and that negotiation doesn't exist anymore. Some of them we would go back. It, it would take us decades to convince Taliban, like, you know what, we need to have women in the security sector, we need to have women in law enforcement because they're there to serve women. And how would you counter a woman's criminal activity if you don't have women in law enforcement? It's going to be, it's going to take us decades to convince Taliban, even if they would be open to listen to anyone. But I, I uh, hardly believe in that. It's going to be difficult to convince them. Second, even if we convince them, we would lose the capabilities that we have invested in the last 20 years. So I would say we would definitely go back, but at, at least we would, um, um, we would, um, protect some of the achievements we have in terms of the, the foundations. No, what we have in hand, like as an outcome, but some of the, the, um, the achievement of, of, of the foundation. But if we could have a more inclusive government, we at least can keep the hope that we can protect some of the achievements, not all, of course. And that, and that some that I'm talking about is the minimum we can maintain in terms of the foundations. That's it. So I would say let's push at least it's, I mean, we have reached to a point where I would say um, um, something is better than nothing. We should be satisfied with the minimum we can get out of the, the, the whole situation. So I would say if we can push for more inclusive government where all walks of life in Afghanistan is represented, all the genders are represented, um, the minority is represented, of course, it's going to be difficult, but at least we can, we can push for that. It's not easy, but we need to figure out like what are the um, what what is there that the Taliban would um, from the international community side, the international community can offer, or the international community can uh, stop supporting Taliban. I mean, what is there the Taliban is craving for that, and the international community can has can have leverage on that, and then based on that, the international community can push them for more inclusive government. We need to protect the media in Afghanistan. If we want to protect women in Afghanistan, we need to protect the media. That is the, the strength of women that has become the strength of women right now. Again, when we are talking about the peaceful resistance, that, that is what uh, keeps women move forward with the resistance. So we need to protect the media if we want to protect the women in Afghanistan. The second one is that even if we go with the worst case scenario where the Taliban would ban the media, or the Taliban would disconnect Afghanistan with the rest of the world, we need to make sure that Afghanistan is not, and its women is not a forgotten once again, like, like the, the pre 9-11 uh, or pre, during the Taliban regime. Uh, so here, uh, like women's uh, organizations are uh, demanding uh, that the Turkish state doesn't recognize uh, the Taliban. So they are protesting uh, for that. Uh, but also there is an argument that uh, since uh, the uh, Turkish state is, I mean, uh, the, the, the ruling power is like the Muslim uh, party, so they can, they can have a say and they can uh, be involved with the Taliban and uh, make a case 
for the human and women's rights. Uh, but this but this doesn't mean that it uh, it is a recognition, but it's an involvement uh, so that there can uh, they can create a difference uh, uh, and they can contribute to a change. Uh, what do you think uh, about that? I mean, do you think uh, like not recognizing uh, is the best way, or like getting involved? It can be another way. Uh, what is your uh, evaluation on that? Um, recognition comes when we will have Taliban changing the whole constitution. They change the governance system to a ruling regime. That is when the, the, the recognition comes. Right now, it's, it's a, um, I would say, um, an armed fighting uh, group that, that, that was a terrorist organization, but some of the countries doesn't, uh, a terrorist group, but some of the countries um, tries to change them to, to decrease the level of, of the, um, um, I mean, to change the definition from a terrorist group to an insurgent group, no matter what. But end of the day, we do have the same constitution and we do have the same governance system right now. Taliban has not changed that. So I would say the recognition comes last, comes when Taliban makes their mind like, okay, governance is too big for us to swallow. We can't do that. We don't have the financial means because governance is costly, not just financially, but at the same time, it requires a huge technical capacity, human capacity, the Taliban doesn't have it. And even now they're frustrated. So I would say when Taliban would go back, uh, would shift from the governance, and the governance basically is about public services. You're serving public. You're not ruling them with fear. So when they shift from a governance, a governance structure to the ruling regime, that's when the recognition comes. But at the same time, I do believe that Taliban um, would be open to have a, a discussion with Turkey. It's, again, it's difficult, but Taliban will be, if we do a comparison, will be open to talk to Turkey, maybe uh, much better than China. Apart from the Chinese um, Taliban, maybe economic interest, but they, they will be very open to, to, to do that. So I would say the, the role that Turkey as a government can play in the current situation right now to make sure that Taliban creates a more inclusive government, give space to, to other parts of the country, because Taliban, even among Pashtun tribe of Afghanistan or Pashtun ethnic in Afghanistan, uh, they don't represent all Pashtuns. That's the problem let alone the, the, the religious minorities, let alone the, the ethnic minorities, let alone, let alone all those other small tribes. But then we come with a, a major concern, that's the, the women's inclusion, that's the women's rights, not just the inclusion. That is where Turkey can play, a, 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 I would say, a big role. To push these agendas with the, uh, in the talks with the Afghan, uh, not the Afghan government, but I would say the Taliban right now. Um, and at the same time, they can also push for protection of the laws we have. They need to make sure that the terms of the laws, which protects women's rights, which protects the human rights, which protects the minorities, which uh, I would say, um, which helps us to, to protect the, the human right, we need to make sure that the laws are not replaced. That's also something that Turkey can play a major role because right now, Taliban, again, um, Turkey has its Islamic hat. That's something we share together with the public and with the Taliban as well. So right now, Taliban, with some of the laws, Taliban might claim like this is a Western imported uh, or Western made law. This is a non-Islamic law. No, we don't have any law which goes against the Islamic values. All of them are aligned with the Islamic rules and the Islamic principles and the Islamic values. So if Turkey pushes something for something like that, Turkish reads that, Turkish government reads that like, okay, there's a law, the constitution is not going, I mean, I've read the constitution, it's not going against the Islamic law. But I would say Turkish government's involvement in decreasing the level of violence and the level of, I would say, the extreme level of um, operation, but at the same time, protection of some of what we have achieved, Turkish government can, can play a vital role. And that can happen now. But then, if they would shift to, to the ruling regime, Turkish government, I would recommend not to recognize them. Because they, then we, will, we would lose the leverage of, I mean, having the international community's engagement in Afghanistan later. Part of the reason that we had the coalition 
uh, which could easily get the approval from all the countries, all the decision-making countries to enter Afghanistan was because it was not a state. It was not a legitimate state and it could make the decision very easy for them to enter. Do you have any recommendations for women's rights activists in Turkey on what can, uh, they can do to support Afghan women? Um, well, we just discussed about the Turkey's rule in Afghanistan and considering how vital that is, that is again applies, the same applies to the women's activists in Turkey. I'm just connecting what I told earlier is first, Turkish government can play a vital role in Afghanistan. Second, the women's activists can play double role in, in, in the whole situation in Afghanistan. First, they can push their values through their government. And then the beneficiary is going to be the woman of Afghanistan. So it's an indirect, I would say, support to the Afghan government, but a very strong one and, and, and a very strategic one. So they can make sure that their government ha remains engaged with the whole politics in Afghanistan. And the women's rights in Afghanistan remains a very, I would say, a major component in, in, in their basket. I mean, the Turkish government's basket, because they can talk to Taliban about anything. That can be politics, that can be Turkishes, um, I would say uh, the, the uh, security, but at the same time, it can be something uh, relevant to economics, ec economy. What, what I need, I mean, the, the uh, women's rights activists in, in Turkey, they need to make sure that the women's rights holds equal value when it comes to these levels of engagement and, and uh, I would say talks between the Turkish government and the Taliban. So the second one is the direct support they can um, give to the women of Afghanistan. Um, let me just start. What is the humanitarian side of it, the humanitarian assistance? Of course, when, when we are talking of the women's rights activists, we are talking about individuals. And they can hardly play a role, uh, or I would say very organized um, role in terms of providing the humanitarian assistance that the Afghan woman directly needs right now. But I would say they can be the best and the loudest voices for those who can't raise their voice anymore. The problem is that a month ago, I believe that Afghanistan soon will become irrelevant to the rest of the world. It's gonna drop from the headlines. Um, and as soon as Afghanistan would drop, would be dropped from the headlines, then everything will be gone. That is when we even, I mean, even the, uh, the, the very civilized and peaceful resistance would have any value anymore. Even if, if I would say Taliban is trying to behave well because women have media in hand, it's because Taliban has got something with the international community and they need to make sure that they don't lose that. So I would say, um, First, the media has, has got their own business. They've got their own priorities. Anything which is hot, they're going to go for that. Afghanistan situation, the women's situation has been a hot topic for them. They picked it for a while. But it's going to it's, it's fade away over time. Uh, I would say they can be the strongest voice independently for the Afghan women. Because again, Afghan women, they're not going to be relevant to the world politics, to the uh, international media, and no one's going to hear from them anymore. But just to be able to generate the support all across the world for the women, we need to have the, uh, the women's rights activists uh, to be their voice, to check on them. And the, 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 I mean, the, this category of the population in Turkey, um, I think they're, they're, they're the best to, to, um, to point out in terms of their rule. They're the best. And normally it changes to a, it, it leads to a policy change. So that is why I would say they can be the strongest voice of the Afghan women, those on the ground who can't raise their voices anymore, but at the same time, those who loses the means to raise their voices. And the women in Turkey, they do have the means in hand to, to be that voice. And it's more practical as well. Uh, may I ask you what would be your plan for the future, for the future of your country, for your future of career? Would you plan on again playing another role in changing uh, the, the, the existing Taliban regime? What is my plan? I would say um, 
it depends sometimes where life takes us and it's so difficult for us to to over plan our lives because things keeps unfolding so quickly um yes we get prepared mentally and with all the means we have we get prepared for 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 tomorrow for a different day but end of the day things things keeps being unfolded so quickly it doesn't mean that it's it's um unplanned it it keeps unfolding without a plan but we may not have sufficient information on those plans or access to those information so what i would say is this is something that i i said when we had the kabul fall under taliban control or the the government collapse and i i i still believe in the same and it's a stronger belief than that than uh 15th august afghanistan is not just a piece of land for us it's not just a country for us that we have been living and we have been living with proud and dignity holding our heads high up it was the identity i mean that that's that that was something that we've been defining ourselves with that word afghan and we took the pride but then what i would say what the future plan for me personally would be the last thing i can do in this world is to give up on my country and the reason is because i would then i would give up on my identity but end of the day what i would say and that is actually defining my plans what i would say this is yes we lost this game at this point in time but we lost a round of the game the game is not over yet and what makes me hopeful is that when we look back at the uh pre 2001 Taliban could rule the country just a few years things changed again and i'm i'm i i i have to um reemphasize to myself now that we are going to change it back i might be young i might be old i might have gray hairs i might have white hairs or it might be my kids and my future generation they're going to bring the change because again we don't have the the option to give up on our identity we may live out of afghanistan but because we want to train ourselves and the future generation to be that change factor i would say to reestablish our identity we will keep fighting for it we will keep fighting for our identity we will keep fighting for the day that we will bring the change and we won't give up it might may take us time it may take a lot of passions a lot of patience actually and a lot of passion too a lot of energy and it may take generations but we are going to make it happen that's not us and i hope i would be alive that we will have our colorful flag which carried so many values and hopes and dreams replaced with the black and white flag of taliban once again and it will fly in the skies again it's difficult at this point in time when we when we see we have lost everything but it doesn't mean i mean we are helpless i mean how i would define myself right now is that we are helpless but we are not hopeless the hope is there the hope for a different tomorrow is there